thanks everybody for coming along to our first KX meetup in San Francisco. So it's very exciting to be here, exactly. <laughs> Give me an excuse to come to San Francisco in the month of January and February from uh, snowy New York. So it says different from what an Irish person is used to at this time of year. So uh, we have three great speakers here tonight and uh, we hope you enjoy it all. And then we'll be going for drinks afterwards to Louis, which is on Stevenson Lane, I believe. Um, which is two blocks away. Um, is there anything else I'm missing, Abby? Uh, no. Was there anything else? Um, so I'll just introduce our first speaker, which is uh, Jay Han, who gave the same talk a couple Hi. of months ago in New York, and it was very, very interesting. So I'll hand it over to Jay. Thank you. Okay, hi guys, uh, I'm Jay, and I'm going to show you some uh, demo uh, plotting tools that you can use from Q and KDB itself without leaving KDB. So, its name is QPL plot. I'll explain the name and the background after sh uh, showing you a few plots. So, any demo is, you know, any demo requires an animation. So if you look at it, uh, both x axis and y axis, they are both changing as the numbers keep piling up. Okay. So now the animation is done. I can tell you a story about a good round number of 100 million. It's a very good round number. I'm not going for billion because I'm a poor person, but 100 million serves our purpose very well. So what I want you guys to think about is how much time does it take to get 100 million data points? And if you think about it, oh, just to make it easy, we'll just use a random number between 0 and 1 as a data point, okay? It takes about 28 hours if you get one millisecond, you know, one random number. Keep piling them up, 28 hours. About three years if you do it by one second, okay? So what you can say confidently is that it takes time, therefore money, and a lot of expenses to get this amount of data. And you get the data, why? Because you think you can get some value out of the data. So what do we want to do? We want to see data as patterns, behaviors, mm, some, you know, anomalies and whatever else we can see, right? But nobody is going to sit down and go through 100 million numbers. That's just too much. So we try to do visualization to concisely summarize the data as much as possible and use our eyes to do brain's heavy work. So 100 million and you think, oh, I cannot feed it to my plotting tool. I'm gonna sample some data because 100 million, let's sample it down to say million. Your 1% know, sample should, be, should suffice. So you fire up some whatever the big guns that you have and try to sampling, try to do it carefully, don't introduce any bugs there and then convert the data sample to what plotting tool wants. Because very likely your data you gather is not what your plotting tool would like to have as an input. And uh, so you have to do you know, conversion and then wait for the tool to finish and repeat because likely you made an error somewhere. You have to repeat the whole thing. Oh, by the way, this points to an uh, uh, interesting conundrum in that now you have maybe one out of 10 po uh, possibilities that you got everything right. Because you have a data source database somewhere, 
you have the conversion tool, you have a plotting thing. So you have three things, and one out of eight is the proper you know, possibility you can get everything right. So there are already seven ways you can go wrong. And actually, it's eight because even if you got right, you could be mistaken, you got it wrong, and repeat the thing. And I say 10 because, well, the world hates you. So it'll crash, you know, everything will crash. And, well, 10 because, you know, Murphy's Law can strike you when, even when the world doesn't hate you. And, oh, hygiene is very important. As you convert and move data, slosh around, blah, blah, blah. If you ever like stash some data from one place to another place, and well, you have a database management system, you pull the data out, and you have to kind of manage it now outside of management system. You have to do it yourself. Congrats. So, oh, I don't like this. Okay, so, so opposite of ingestion, you know, blah, 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 disperse, dissipate, um, can read it, and uh, at the end, spew and vomit. It just ties nicely with data hygiene issue. So the point is that going the opposite way of data ingestion costs you money, and your marginal cost of production goes sky high, because if you, know, if you take one unit of time to do something, now it takes 10 units of time or whatever, well, your productivity is shot. Your throughput is not one tenth anymore, right? Because you want to go home at the end of the day without having something done. So while we are waiting, let's try to do something like this. Write a simple script. And um, what we are going to do here is first line here. Oops. You load the Q QPL plot library and load the database, 100 million, and then pick out the column that you're interested in. And this line is just um, uh, bookkeeping. It's just initialized the whole thing. So, you know, what it's doing is that we'll set the device, plotting device to X Windows Cairo version, uh, set the color to blue. And then we're going to do a, make a histogram of the random numbers distribution, which is, by the way, uh, doing histogram would be one of the most important things and most frequent things you'll be doing if you're doing data analysis using plotting, because histogram is the one um, is the method you use to see the distribution or the patterns behind the data. And because I'm a nice person, I'm going to label my uh, plot as a x, x, you know, values, frequency, blah, blah, blah. And uh, finish the whole thing. So let's just run it. And this is 100 million data uh, random numbers. And spread around. So basically what it's doing is a zero and one. And these are 1,000 bins. And for each bin, we are counting how many uh, random numbers fit into that bin, right? That's how you do the histogramming. And the number you fit in here is 100,000 across 1,000 bins, 100 million data points, okay? So let me just do, uh, then I can just show you this number here. This is the amount of time it took to, I got lucky because, you know, Linux file caching was slightly better than before. So it took 780 milliseconds in this case. It can take up to like five on my machine and ate up about two gigs of memory to load the data here, right? And then this PL hist histogram took 585 milliseconds and ate up just 1,200 bytes additional memory within your KDB. So what happened here is that we load the data into database as we normally would do, and 
we just tell the library, I want to plot the data, and it happened. Okay. Oh, stingy crowd here. <laughs> By the way, that makes interesting video. So <laughs> don't be shy about clapping. <laughs> so now, let me show you more plots. OK, uh, kind of pointless, mm -hmm. looks neat. OK, streamlines of you know, multi-dimensional uh, multi data. You take the contour you know, down to, this is like two sets of data, right? Yellow line, green line. And you can like, put the numbers here. Um, some transformation of the set data, another transformation. This is pointless circle, but circles are good. <laughs> some potential also plus and minus. And then, well, this is probably more familiar to the a lot of financial people. And, you know, we can still do the simple things. Oh, I like this because, just because, well, Q is supposed to be a vector oriented language. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to plot some vectors? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Far too kind. Thank you. Okay, and nothing tells the world that you are a serious engineer like the logarithmic scale on your you know plotting, you know, <laughs> seriously. And nothing tells the world that I'm doing big data. You know, if you're doing just linear scale graph, come on. <laughs> and shout out to the Moscow people. They are doing the meetup tonight, or they already done it a few hours ago. And it's kind of like random data things. And then you can kind of do kind of like, you know, animation style. And this only just to show you, show off the, you know, possible, you know, ca capability of, you know, like, hue, saturation of the colors, and so on, and so on. You know, like this. And then, you know, more scientific looking things. Okay, <laughs> now, this is going to be, uh, oh, I just made it like this so that you can see a whole bunch of options that you have in this library about uh, how you make a plot. So. Uh, interactively, I can show it on the uh, windows like this, and I can go down to like uh, PDF and blah, blah, you know, SVG, ping for your web browsers, and uh, SVG for the web browsers too. And a lot of other, you know, there are some other drivers I haven't installed on my machine, but uh, should work just fine. So I'm going to just this time use X Windows. Uh, I just a lot of shaded graph here, you know, contours around, uh, in the you know nice sidebar about the magnitude of the quantity you're plotting and things like that. What's a boba? I have no idea. It's uh, <laughs> it's an example I got, and I I don't want to speculate the meaning behind it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> and, you know, some, so, some you know, weird looking things. And then now, I'm going to do, uh, this time, device. I'm going to say demo.pdf. Done. Right? It, it just doesn't take much to actually write the PDF. So let's just open the thing, and let me see. Let me make it bigger. So this is what you would get as a PDF file. And then this is like the data, uh, the colors, uh, the magnitudes on the z-axis. You're looking at the x, y. And then you can see, OK, smudge it with the whatever interpolation algorithms that you have to you know, see the you know, shades around there. And then oh, I want to see it more like 3D, and then you can see different styles. OK, quit this PDF. I'm done. So 
let me then tell you a little bit of story behind QPL plot. So name is obviously Q plus PL plot. And I wish I could pretend that I wrote all the code that made these colorful graphs by myself, but I won't and I cannot, right? So PL plot is an open source library that has been in the works from about this time, 1992. And I think there was some check-in uh, just the other day, and there will be a new version coming out in a few months' time. Uh, so it's been in development for a very long time, and fairly you know, robust. And what I've done is basically wrote a Q front end so that you can uh, use a library from just by writing Q. And why did I do that? Only because, well, I kind of like Q, but then I don't want to switch out to you know, export data out into somewhere else and plot data and then go back and forth and stuff like that. And so I just want to stay within KDB. And I don't like, like jumping back and forth between different languages if I can help it. So, and then, you know, it's a little bit of an issue as to database manages data very well. Why pull the database? I mean, wh why, you know, take the data out of the database? And don't, I, I want to like, avoid unnecessary, you know, unnecessary samplings and introducing biases in my analysis as I, you know. So basically, what you will be getting is a set of APIs that you can use interactively, as I demonstrated here. And by the way, in case you ever doubt it, everything I ran Nothing was pre-computed or anything like that. It was done in all real time. All the you know, Q code was running as I pressed enter and it kept popping up the graphs and you know. And uh, I've shown you like PDF example. So you can, you can set the API and say, okay, uh, write my plot to this file or something as, you know, from the AP, using the API and run it without you know, drawing anything on the screen. So it, that could be useful if you're writing some reports and things like that. So let's just take a quick look at the original uh, API from plot of, you know, so I use plhist for histogram. And this kind of looks, this is the main page for that. So it takes six, six arguments, and you can see the types of the arguments, okay, How, what data points count, and then the array of the data, and then you, know, you need to give it like min and max, number of bins, and so on. Then you can see that plhist in qplplot takes exactly the uh, same forms. So that way, I don't have to write main pages again. But then uh, there are a couple of wrinkles. Is that K allows up to Q, uh, up to eight parameters in the function. And if you go above eight, Q says uh, take param and wouldn't let you do anything. Some of the plot APIs, the worst one takes 24 arguments in C. <laughs> so some you know, wrangling around. So you know, I'm trying to like, document it correctly. So um, when people use it, they, they can go back and say, OK, for this, oh, I have to do something con a little bit contorted. But then that cannot be avoided. OK. So well, very soon, it will go up there. And this is my email, and you could know, just mention QPL plot, and I'll take some questions and try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Just really generally, what do you use Q 
QPL pod for? Oh, um, you know, simply I'm just starting, uh, I just noticed the poverty of the plotting tools that, you know, that does what I like it to do. I mean, I could use some other things out there that, are, you know, by no means they're bad, they're good, but then I just want to stay within the QDB, I mean KDB and do it inside. I'm just playing with it, it's my hobby actually. It's so I, I don't use it for production just yet. I can't yet, but then it's nice to have plotting tools. Okay, some other questions. Um, I was, before we were looking at the map page, the uh, PL plot, they use a different data structure for the data set that it feeds in, right? Compared to Q. So, how does that transfer work? Because oh. it looks like you're not copying anything. No, I'm not copying. Okay. For the most data, I, I'm guessing most of the plots you'll be making is kind of one dimensional arrays. For that uh, case, uh, access method is exactly the same. It's a C. Yeah. So you just you know in the PL hist, only thing it does is uh, okay, where is the array in inside the queue? Pointer, pass the pointer to to the you know to the API in the PL hist uh, API that just takes a pointer argument, and it's read only. So PL plot does not change anything. So we just you know then it just takes the argument and then runs it. For, so there is no overhead for the uh, simple one-dimensional cases. For two-dimensional cases, uh, because the way Q lays out its data structure in two, you know, two D matrix is different from what PL plot expects, I have to do you know a little bit of wrangling to make that work. But uh, for the for this kind of one-dimensional cases, there is no uh, extra memory. Is the overhead significant for like the 2D and higher cases? Uh, I would say not really. I mean, it it will have to. You have to like construct a bunch of you know, pointers. So yeah, there is that overhead, mm -hmm. but then yeah, still, yeah, you just you construct them and then you know just keep the pointer back to, to the PL plot right. and PL plot takes and run. Okay. You know. Because yeah, right now my plotting solution for K mm -hmm. is actually to integrate it with uh, R. Mm -hmm. But then you need to pass the data into R. Right. Like large data sets. That's just right. That's, uh, so that is a uh, use case I kind of wanted to avoid right. so that I don't have. And then this way I'm staying you know, all within Q. Right. I don't have to like learn R or anything. I don't have to write out R script or anything like that. I don't have to export the data to disk or convert or anything. I can just do it you know, inside and data stays within the database. Right. Okay. Okay. Okay then. All right, thank you. So our next speaker is going to be Yang Guo, and he works with a customer of ours here uh, just a few blocks away in San Francisco. Um, and he's going to be talking about using Q with asynchronous HTTP. So I'll hand it over to Yang when he's ready. <laughs> all righty. Uh, all right. So uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about asynchronous HTTPS within Q. Um, my motivation for this is actually very similar to Jay. So initially, I started building up a couple of projects that required connections um, out to the web. So especially over here on the West Coast, everyone's building SaaS services. And for smaller test-based stuff, it's really easy to hook up to a SaaS service, so then you don't need the overhead of building something yourself. I mean, even something as simple as, let's say, a web server, it's really nice to hook up to like Mandrill or one of those other guys and just be able to send emails on the fly rather than maintaining your own web server and doing all of those things. Um, requesting data is, is a big one for me. Like I like to connect to different data feeds and also parsing websites. It will be like you can think of a situation where you want to scrape a bunch of websites, standardize the output, and then put it all in a table and persist that table down all into one system. So that was the kind of motivation for that. Um, initially, I was using Node a lot to do a lot of these tasks. But like Jay, I didn't like switching back and forth between two languages. Um, I didn't like maintaining two different processes with basically two different workflows. It started to get really annoying. And I was like, well, can I do better? And uh, this is basically what I came up with. So 
basically, like I said, everything is in the cloud, but uh, based on what I used before, so Q can do HTTP requests, but there's a couple of uh, difficulties. One is HTTPS requests. It's hard to get that natively. Um, I know there's a way to set it up, but I had a lot of trouble doing that. And the second one is basically all of the requests are sync requests. So you can imagine, uh, and this is an example actually I was talking with Jay about, imagine if you were going, you were like, let's say a Bitcoin trader. Uh, for the Bitcoin exchanges at the beginning, all of them were basically HTTP requests. They're, they weren't WebSockets, they weren't push-based requests, they were all pull. So each time you want to request a new price in the system, you basically need to pull from that site. Um, if there's any latency in that connection, you basically have to wait till one pull request is done before you go for the second pull request. That can get very annoying, especially if you have one server pulling from multiple sources. Uh, a good example is you're pulling from four different exchanges and you're pulling both their quote feed and their trade feed. When you're thinking about web scraping, you might be scraping from 10 different websites at the same time. You don't want to be doing that serially. You want to basically send out those requests and when they come back, do some logic before sending out a second set. Um, so that's kind of the motivation for the async part. The other part is the HTTPS. Basically all of these SaaS services, they require some type of authentication. They're generally post requests. So you definitely want to be able to have a HTTPS request and you want to be able to put in any arbitrary headers into your request in order to basically get that authentication through. Um, so yes, essentially we want to use web services directly from Q. And that way we can handle everything in Q and once that data comes into Q, we can use the power of Q to do what Q is good at, which is parsing stuff, putting stuff into data, persisting, running logic on top of it. Um, so as we want to leverage what we know. And in this case, it's essentially very uh, similar to Jay's situation. I was looking around for a good library to use. I tried a few different ones, but libcurl was basically the one that I found was most comprehensive. Um, you can basically compile it statically, you can link it up very, very easily. It has basically everything out of the box. It's very powerful. And the um, question is, how do you get that in a queue? So we basically just wrote a wrapper around it. And uh, I actually have the code here. So it is very queue style code. And this is basically a set of requests. Um, so you have your post async here and then your getters here. And essentially it just runs a separate loop. Um, it, it creates a separate thread and then it just runs the select loop over that thing. Uh, I try to lower the overhead as much as possible. So essentially it just uses pointers and passes pointers back and forth. And that way you don't recreate data point, uh, basically copy data back and forth between the threads over and over again. So I wanna go through some examples. Um, can you guys see that? I like writing code in really small font because <laughs> that way I see more. <laughs> yeah, this has been a pretty bad habit. So essentially, um, so the thing is, an aside to this is, uh, you'll see a lot of stuff in here that might be a little non-standard. Uh, again, inspired by Node, I really like the way that Node handled the packages. So like when you want to install new files, when you want to run new things, it's pretty much standard. Um, so to help myself, because I like writing a lot of libraries, uh, I basically created this like QP package, which is essentially allows you to install things even with um, add-ons into standardized folders, and that way you can just basically run QP to require, and then require the packages that you need. So this one, I basically just run this QP um, .http, and then I just load this package. So the first one is I'm just going to pull Google data, right? <laughs> And uh, you can see the way that this works is you basically put in a callback function here and this function takes in three parameters. The first one is the data that gets returned. The second one is the uh, response code from the URL and the third thing is the response code from curl itself. So you can think of three situations that happens. The first one is you get the data back. Everything is nice and peachy, right? And then you should get data. You should get 200 as your HTTP response code and your curl should return no error. The second issue is if you put in the wrong URL, then you should get some garbage data back most likely. Um, your HTTP response code is gonna be non-200, could be something else, and your curl code is zero. And the last one is, for example, if I had no internet, then I should get 
probably nothing back for the data, nothing back on the response code, and I should get a non-zero response code back for uh, the curl one. So this should cover all three of this, those situations. Um, I wrote something very simple here. Basically, I said, I just want this thing to succeed. So if the response code is 200 and curl is zero, then giving back my HTML data, um, otherwise giving back an error. So I can run this, and then if I come over here and type in HTML, you'll see that I have Google as a web page down here. Um, and you saw that the response is basically instant, even though the pool probably takes like 200 to 400 milliseconds here. Uh, the second one is I'm going to pull a website that I'm hoping is fake. And then you can see here, if I look at error, you'll see that is 06, right? So it can't resolve the DNS, and then we know that there's an error. Um, I created this helper function called pipe, which essentially does this, because you can think of it as you really only care about two states of the world um, in general, right? One is you get the data that you want back, and the second is something else happens. So basically, this pipe function kind of abstracts away this part and just allows you to say, well, if it's success, then I get the data back. If it's not, I want my two response codes back. Just makes things a lot easier. Um, so let me open up 1235. So with 1235, what I did was I basically just copied the usual .z.ph function, and I added in here. So I want to get the response. Uh, I want to copy the response back here. So I'm going to run that, and then um, what I can do here is basically there's three functions. There's one that's get async, which is the simplest just getter function. There's get async h, which is a getter function that allows you to put in arbitrary headers. And the third one is um, post async, which allows you to post with appropriate headers and appropriate data. So I'm going to run get async h here. And what you'll see is uh, so I basically ran it against this. What you see here is that you can see that I have my authorization as well as my arbitrary other tag, which I specified over here, the auth and the other tag. And it's basically just a list of strings. And that way I can put in any arbitrary header I want, which satisfies at least with the services I've looked at um, most of the requirements that they have. So the question is, what can you do with this? Well, I have four examples I ha here. And um, so I'm in finance. I care a lot about data. And I like the fact that I can pull arbitrary data together to link them and to basically sort them out within queue. Uh, so the first example I have is literally pulling data from the OCC, so basically the options clearing exchange. Uh, the second one is what I was talking about before with Mandrel. So basically, I don't need to set up my own web server. I can basically have Q send me emails each time it needs to upload data. Uh, uh, for example, let's say I have a um, data scraping request. It goes through a certain amount of data, and I want to know which ones succeeded and which ones failed. Once I have that, I want it to email me a nice condensed report. That would be really nice. But I only want to run Q on that system. So by hooking it up to Mandrel, I don't need to set up a web server. Everything can be super lightweight, and I can just send it through Mandrel's uh, system. The third one I want to look at is Quandle, which is basically a place that you can find a lot of data. Um, this one's really nice because essentially, Quandle already presents this data in table form. If we can pull it directly into Q, we can essentially do any type of analysis on a whole host of data, from, for example, common market data to real estate, venture cap, uh, GDP data. It basically unlocks your world in terms of the analysis that you can do within here. Um, and another one, this is my little pet thing, is uh, Bitcoin, just because this is a very interesting market, but that's a separate story. Uh, so this is basically using Bitfinex's API. I think Bitfinex, actually Bitfinex probably doesn't have a WebSocket connection. I think Bitstamp does. But a lot of these, especially the um, le less uh, above board, uh, Bitcoin exchanges, they basically only have HTTP requests because a lot of them traditionally build out these platforms using like a node framework or a Django framework. So um, they don't have push uh, anything really. 
this way you can basically have a bunch of async requests, have this thing go on like every 30 seconds, and then not worry about the fact that maybe their internet is going to be slow and everything's going to lag and then you're going to have late prices. If it lags, you've already sent out three requests, you're going to get three requests back at the same time, you should be okay. So from a trading perspective, this is actually very good and you can actually make this thing abstracted out to something that mimics a push strategy as well. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm just going to require all four of these packages. Cool. So the first one is I want to make sure that the internet works, but this is essentially sending an email to myself. Um, I'm going to send this and then let's take a look at what XX says. So it says here, it's me. I sent it, it gave me an ID, and if I look at my phone, I should have gotten a message. So it's pretty easy. I actually use this to manage a lot of the processes that I have running, just simply because you know that as long as you have an internet connection and you need an internet connection if you're pulling anything from online, um, you can successfully send out an email. It's pretty handy. Uh, the nice one is they both handle emails and also HTML emails and they also handle attachments. So if you want to actually send a PDF or anything else to yourself, you can do so just via this as well. It's very, very flexible. Um, so yeah, this one would be the H1. The second one I want to show you is Quando. So this one is pretty nice. Right here, I can pull USA and GDP. So this is USA GDP price series. If we take a look at this, we basically see we can get all these values and we can just typecast the data if we wanted to. So I can get data on anything I want off of a single request. I can run 10 of these in a series just by writing in each statement over here and I can pull time series of GDP of the entire world to run my analysis. It's pretty nice. Um, and this one is basically NASDAQ data. So Apple, everyone loves Apple. And if we take a look at this, once it loads, there you go. So there you go, Apple data. And it comes in async. So once you request the data, you don't need to wait for it to finish, right? You can write the logic about it finishing in the callback. Um, you can basically have the program go ahead and do anything else. It basically uh, completely changes your workflow. And once the data comes back, you can let the logic handle that part and go on to something else. For Bitcoin, this is um, Bitfinex request quotes. And I'm just going to request a quote from Bifinex. Hopefully Bifinex has not crashed. And there you go. Some Bitcoin data. Um, I can hit the request again. And some more data. So you can just keep on pushing this thing over and over again. Uh, this is OCC. You can get OCC data. And then we can take a look at OCC volume for today, for example. And there you go. So this is the open interest on Microsoft, uh, Microsoft options for every single strike and every single expiry for today. And you can see what the open interest is. So you can think of a situation where if you want to do some end of day research, you can just pull data from OCC into your system. You can pull data from um, Quando and get the stock prices in. You can pull data from Yahoo and get the dividend and splits in, like from a financial perspective. Merge all of them together and then try to see, okay, so where in here do I see some trends? What do I think is important? Um, once you're done with that, you can basically run the analysis, maybe even use a plotting tool, generate some plots, right? And then put it in Mandrel and then send it to yourself. So it streamlines the entire process. You can do everything within Q, and you don't really have to worry about going out to another system, which I, I absolutely love. Um, and the last example is Yahoo. So we can take a look at Microsoft from Yahoo's perspective. And then there you go. And this is basically the data that we just scraped directly off of Yahoo, which is pretty, pretty nice as well. And you can see here, everything is essentially just very Q style. You give it the callback, Yahoo comes back with a CSV, you tell it that it's a CSV, and then it just loads it in here. So it's pretty nice. Um, so how does it work? It's, I'm not going into as much detail about this, but essentially the way that it works is when you load in the shared library, it spins up a separate thread. Um, and that spread thread is essentially used purely for the curl operations. Uh, curl essentially does native HTTP multiplexing. So the way that it works is whenever you send a request 
into Q. Q will send that request into that separate thread. That spread will do, thread will do its processing, do all of the management there. And then once it's done, it basically sends a notification back into the main thread. And then the main thread takes that data, returns it, and then cleans up all of the objects that it created. Because um, one rule in Q is you have to destroy the objects that you created in the same thread. So that gets over that hurdle. Um, and then that way, you basically never lock the main queue process at all. And the entire thing is pretty lightweight because you don't really send copies of data back and forth. You create the data in the main thread and give it a reference in a separate thread. So everything else is worked on by pointers. Um, it essentially makes things fairly quick and also especially for larger data sets. Like for example, uh, a bigger data set is, let's say I want to pull like P2P's hot these days. If I want to pull all loan data historically for like P2P loans on Lending Club, uh, that's gigabytes worth of data. But you can still send it through an HTTP request. Once it comes back, you can basically load it directly into queue without doing any copying, which is pretty nice. Um, so what can we do with this? We went through some of these examples. We can do a lot more. Basically, as long as anything has an HTTP hook, you can actually even use this for something like GitHub if you wanted to, because GitHub has an HTTP hook. Um, you can basically hook it into queue and then apply whatever other logic you want within queue. Uh, it basically opens up your world to anything anybody else has created in, in there. Uh, further improvements. This is the current one I'm working on. Uh, I've ran out of time a little bit, but I intend on finishing this in the future. So it's streaming data. This one is mainly for Twitter. So there's a few services that essentially run this kind of weird uh, HTTP request. Instead of doing like a WebSocket or something, they basically open up an HTTP request, start streaming data through, and then never close that request. And their logic is basically, as long as you keep reading that data, then this is basically like a push system. So they keep it open forever. This is how um, Twitter's Firehose works. Uh, there's a little modification that needs to be done in here. So essentially, right now, I have this thing sent back full requests back. But all I have to do is just say, OK, if you're requesting it as a streaming service, then pass the messages along directly, and then you'll be OK. Um, but that opens your world at least to Twitter data, which you can basically capture. Uh, it gen generally comes back in JSON files. So luckily, Q now handles JSON pretty nicely. Um, and then you can basically create a table out of that, and then just persist that straight down. So now you get Twitter data in, you can mix it in with all the other data that you have. And the last part is a static library compilation. So like libcurl, uh, one thing I really liked is actually QML. So QML basically compiles statically. So QML is basically the math library, and I use that pretty extensively. Um, right now I have this on compiling onto the shared library, which is pretty good, but it makes it not that portable. Uh, so I intend on making this more of a static library in the flavor of QML, so that way you can basically just download this thing, run it, and then it fully compiles, and you should be good to go. So those are the last two changes that I'm thinking of this library, then otherwise I think it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, so any questions about this? Yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. Yes. So uh, other services that expose uh, their data in not through HTTP per se, but say protocol or Swift or some other binary data formats that you can handle to? Um, or would you like to add some or do you notice? Any right now, mainly for me, it was just uh, there were a lot of, like, to really build something, it was a more of a convenience thing, right? Because I wanted to say, okay, there are these services that I can use essentially for free, um, and it makes no sense for me to actually run them myself. Uh, all of them just happen to be HTTP requests, but it, I think curl does handle a lot of different protocols. So as long as curl can handle it, this thing can handle it natively, because it basically reads it off of the protocol right at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? All right. All right. Cool.